Well, good evening, everyone. It is my enormous pleasure to welcome everyone watching here to the Royal Society YouTube channel this evening for what promises to be just a, a, a typically excellent and fascinating discussion about physics, about life, about science communication. My name is Adam Rutherford. I'm a geneticist and author and broadcaster, but tonight we are here to celebrate the 2020 Wilkins Bernal Medawar Prize, which has been awarded to Professor Jim Al-Khalili, um, who I'll be in conversation with tonight. So congratulations to Jim, we'll be hearing from him in just a minute after I get this sort of housekeeping out of the, out of the way. So the Wilkins Bernal Medawar Prize is given annually for excellence in presenting the social function of science, the philosophy of science and the history of science as well. And it's marked by a medal of bronze, which implies that there is also a silver and gold medal above that. But I, I'll, I'll ask Jim about that in just a minute. Uh, it's a prize that brings together three of the Royal Society's historic awards, which is why the name is a, fuse, uh, a, a fusion of those three names, Wilkins, Bernal and and Medawar. And it's got an incredible history of prize winners there. Jim can count himself now amongst uh, historians, philosophers, science communicators, people like Simon Schaffer and Sean Ead and Melvin Bragg, apparently. Anyway, Jim has won this award for his, well, peerless, exceptional, outstanding work in explaining, I think, the most complex ideas in modern physics and therefore the most complex ideas in science in an incredibly approachable way. His contributions have been on as you know, more television series than, um, than we can name, although almost all of them come in the form of two titles of things that oppose each other, like black and white or light and dark. I, I mean, I don't think any of them were actually called that, but you get the idea. He's also presented really landmark programs um, and written books about the history of Arabic science and a number of other books. Uh, and of course, you hear him on the radio many times a year, every Tuesday morning on The Life Scientific, which is currently... Uh, I st think still being broadcast. I think the final show is next week. Um, we'll do, I'll get to Jim in just, just a second. A, a, a tiny bit of housekeeping as well. We want this to be a discussion, a conversation between uh, the, the two of us. And bear in mind that Jim and I have known each other for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. And we've done this many, many times. So forgive us if this is casual. Um, because we, we just like talking to each other about science and this is the type of conversation that we would normally have in a pub or at a festival and I, I, I just think that because we enjoy talking about science so much it's best that you see it like that but we want you to get involved as well so to do that um, go to uh, slido.com I think there's a link in the uh, in the description below the video and use the code hashtag W205. I can see some people have already submitted questions. So I'll get to them as often as I can, but you can upvote um, or downvote questions as appropriate. And then I'll, they'll come to me and I'll select them and ask them for Jim. We've got live captioning available this evening as well. If you want to see these, click on the subtitle slash closed captions button on the bottom bar. And if you want to tweet during the event, use the hashtag um, RSHistSci. Okay, I mean, that was a hell of an intro. So my first question, Jim, is how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure to be chatting to you again. Well, one day we're going to actually get to do this in person because the last <laughs> time we did this was, I think, at the Royal Society on on stage when we were doing the Life Scientific, where I was asking you about your Life Scientific. So let, let's just do that. I know that, you know, when people say this, this person needs no introduction, then they proceed to give an introduction to them. <laughs> Everyone is here to see you, but just for people who don't know you so well, give, give us your 30 second job description. Right, okay. Well, I'm a professor of physics uh, at the University of Surrey, Guildford, where I've been all my academic career, apart from two years at UCL. Um, my background specialism is nuclear physics, theoretical nuclear physics, but I've broadened out in recent years. For the last 20 years, I've, I've, I've split my time 50-50 between being an academic scientist and more sort of public facing. So as you mentioned in the introduction, writing books, doing broadcasting, public lectures, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's something that I've, I, I really feel privileged to, to have been able to do. The University of Surrey has really supported me in this, but before my generation, that wasn't really a thing. You couldn't really do both. You couldn't be a proper scientist and publish papers and, and lecture to students 
and then also go on telly and make programs. Uh, luckily, I think this is something that has changed in recent years. So yeah, I'm a science communicator, but I'm also still very much a practicing physicist. So on that, with the, the title of the talk or the discussion tonight is on, on quantum life or quantum biology. And I, and I do want to talk about that, but I want us to talk about lots of things in between. But just to, just to follow on from what you were just saying, you do actively do research, right? You're not just a lecturer, you're not just a presenter, you're still a research scientist. Yeah, I've got five PhD students I have to look after. I've just got an, uh, a big research grant, which I'm hoping is gonna get greenlit in the next couple of weeks, which is to do research into the foundations of quantum mechanics, what are called open quantum systems. So it's very much theoretical physics. Um, publishing papers, luckily having good PhD students helps with publications of papers because you know they do all the hard work. I, I just offer my words of wisdom to, <laughs> to them. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if all else fails, if push comes to shove, the day job for me is as a research physicist. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I'm looking at the questions and so many of them, I mean, they're absolutely flooding in and so many of them are about quantum biology. And I wasn't planning to talk about that until a bit later in, in the conversation <laughs> when we've warmed up. But why don't we just go straight in the, the those two words sitting next to each other it feels not uncomfortable, but certainly unusual for me as a biologist. Um, we know that the world, the universe is built on quantum mechanisms and uncertainty, but how does it apply to, to biology, to the fleshy stuff that, it, that I study? Yeah, well, I mean, um, although it's not something that's taught at school, you know, certainly in, in, in research, you know, we, we're aware of quantum physics and quantum chemistry. So both physics and chemistry have subfields within them where we have to apply the rules of quantum mechanics, which describe the, the world of atoms and molecules, um, uh, rather than, you know, th so the quantum mechanics is very much embedded in those fields. But you're right, quantum biology seems to be, you know, why would you need quantum mechanics in biology? Well, of course, there's the trivial thing, which is not what this quantum biology is about, which is that even we, you know, living organisms are ultimately made of atoms and molecules. So if you burrow down deep enough, you zoom in to tie enough length scales, you're going to hit the quantum world. So quantum mechanics must play a role at some point in living systems, inside living cells. The interesting question is, so what? You know, well, of course it does, but that doesn't really help us explain the machinery of life. Quantum biology is a new field. It's still speculative. It's controversial in some sense because biologists haven't been trained in quantum mechanics, so they don't like it. Physicists think biology is far too complicated and messy and they'd much rather tweak their dials in their laser labs and control everything. And chemists who sit in the middle think, well, you know, what's all the fuss about? You know, of course, um, biology is chemistry and chemistry relies ultimately on quantum mechanics. Why are you creating a whole new subject <laughs> for that? So there is, there is some controversy about it, but never, despite all that, I and a growing number of, of, of physicists, chemists and biologists are coming to see that there are some interesting problems here, that mechanisms inside living cells that we can't explain properly without appealing to some of the tricks of the quantum world. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, a, that's an excellent description, really, because there, there are some sort of obvious ones that you talk about in, sorry, I mean, this isn't a book plug, but I just happen to have the book that you wrote on this, Life on the Edge. <laughs> <laughs> um, when was that 2016 was it? 2015 um co-written with uh, john j mcfadden also at guildford with you and then he's a biologist so it was used, he's, uh, a, he's a molecular geneticist yes. yes which i found reassuring because i've talked to you about biology and wow um and it, that, <laughs> of course um but there's things like in the book you talk about some of the more obvious interactions between the quantum world and biology, such as photoreception, how we harvest photoreceptors, uh, how, how we harvest photons in order to see really interesting things like magnetoception, so how birds migrate using the magnetosphere, which is, you know, incredibly interesting. Um, th that's less speculative. So talk, talk about those ones that we know about for a second before we get to the more... Yeah. Well, the, the, the most established ones, I think, are that, you know, in, in the quantum realm, particles can jump from A to B via what's called quantum tunneling. So it's the equivalent of moving through a force field. It's like a, it's like a ghost walking through a, a solid wall. You know, it shouldn't happen in the everyday world, but we know in the quantum world it happens. That's not speculative. 
that's the reason the sun shines because of, of, of nuclear fusion. It's protons, quantum tunneling together to make to make helium. Um, it's, it was established all the way back in the in the 80s, certainly, that quantum tunneling can take place inside living cells. Enzymes make use of quantum tunneling. Um, uh, that you, you get quantum tunneling. We're now discovering one of the, some of the research we're doing is quantum tunneling in DNA protons jumping from one strand of the double helix across to the other via rules of quantum mechanics. So that is established. There are others which some people say, yes, that's established, like um, uh, photosynthesis, how, how plants and bacteria harvest light and turn it into chemical energy to, you know, to, to build more sort of biomass. Um, it's one of the most important biochemical reactions in the whole of biology. It's very complicated but it looks like the first stage, how you capture that photon, that lump of energy, particle of light, and deliver it to the reaction center inside the cell requires quantum trickery. Basically, it, it follows multiple paths simultaneously that interfere with each other, which physicists are very used to. You know, we talk about things like the famous two-slit experiment in quantum mechanics, uh, which is all very mind-boggling and, and counterintuitive. The fact that it may happen inside living cells is exciting but the jury's still out on that. Magnetoreception is another interesting one. It's certainly been established that certain birds, marine uh, uh, animals, even insects, have the ability to detect the Earth's weak magnetic field and that it can help them navigate. You know, it's, they have a built-in compass. The controversy is, where is that compass? How does it work? And one of the few um, theories that is still standing is that it has a quantum origin that uh, you know the, the bird the european robin is the famous example how it migrates south across europe every autumn is by capturing photons of light which trigger some quantum process inside proteins in the bird's retina and that quantum process allows them to be very sensitive to their orientation within the, the earth's magnetic field it may be right it may be wrong the cool thing is that it relies on the most wacky idea in quantum mechanics called entanglement, something that even Einstein himself found very uncomfortable. He called it spooky action at a distance, the idea that two separated particles are instantaneously in communication with each other. Well, quantum entanglement may be responsible for um, avian navigation by detecting the Earth's magnetic field. And I just find that, I want it to be true. I want it to be correct. That's not the way we do science, by the way, <laughs> wanting something to be true but it's still up for grabs. I, I, think it's, I think it's fine. And I think it's a healthy way to approach science as well, that, that there is, there's always value in speculation, as long as you recognize that it's speculation and, and you recognize that because it's not stuff that we've, we have direct evidence for yet, you've got to be willing to, uh, to, to have it shot down and move on. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm looking at the questions from, from on Slido. So do, do remember whoever's watching, go to slido.com um, and it's hashtag W205 if you want to ask a question. I, I, predictably smart Royal Society audience asking lots of questions, but I want to talk about the more speculative aspects of that, that you touch on upon, you touch on in your lectures in, in, and in Life on the Edge, such as what are your views? A number of people have asked this. What are your, what are your views on using um, quantum mechanics to explain consciousness? I, I sort of almost felt that coming. <laughs> Um, we do have a chapter in, in, in our book, in Life on the Edge, we sort of go from the, the more established, not mundane, but, you know, sort of less speculative um, applications, mechanisms, through to the more speculative and quantum mechanics and consciousness is towards the end of the book. Um, certainly, um, people like Roger Penrose, who recently won a Nobel Prize, uh, physics, who a collaborator with Stephen Hawking, um, Together with um, uh, Hammerov, a, a collaborator of his, some couple of dead, more than two decades ago, three decades ago now, yeah, um, came up with the idea, a, a potential theory that would link quantum mechanics with consciousness, um, and sort of some quantum mechanism going inside particular molecules in the brain uh, that would trigger uh, consciousness because of quantum mechanics saying that things can be in two, can exist in more than one state at the same time. It's I mean, if I, was, if I was to put money, I wouldn't put much money on it, but I would say, no, I don't think there's anything in that. Um, 
the usual argument is, and it holds true, look, just because consciousness is mysterious and we don't understand it and quantum mechanics is mysterious, and we don't understand it, doesn't mean the two have to be connected in some way, right? Well, you can't, there's always this danger that people use quantum mechanics because it's counterintuitive to explain all sorts of ideas from the speculative to the downright wacky you know, all the way through to, you know, sort of telepathy and, and um, psychic phenomena, just because quantum mechanics sort of somehow gives, it somehow gives them license to, to, uh, uh, to say whatever they like. Quantum consciousness is, is, is not that wacky in the sense that our peer reviewed research papers on the subject, but we're a very, very long way of being able to establish if there is a link or not. That's not part of what people working in quantum biology do today. What we're doing today is very much looking at specific mechanisms, zooming in, trying to design experiments to test them, coming up with theories that explain what you can see. It's a long way before you can start using quantum mechanics to explain something as mysterious as consciousness itself. Yes, I, I, I'd agree with that. I think it's interestingly wrong. It's the best way yeah. to do it. Okay, yes. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, being wrong is an absolute cornerstone of of science and it's something that we should celebrate and and really mm. embrace and lean into being as being wrong as often as possible because that's where we start to make things right or absolutely yeah yeah i think i, I also think and touching on something that you just said then i think it's it is an example of using one thing that we don't really understand to explain something else that we don't really understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it suffers from all sorts of semantic problems and what do you actually mean by consciousness? And that's a discussion for, a, for another pub evening. Um, so we, we can move on from that, but I mean, honestly, there is just dozens of questions coming through and they are, a lot of them are quantum biology related. Um, I can, I can answer them in sort of quick fire, if you like. Yeah, if you like, if you like. Too much time on them. Well, I tell you what, here's an interesting question, um, which, which is, I suppose, talks about how you got into quantum biology. Mm. I actually lost who the questioner was, so I'm sorry about that. But it was a question which was, how, what, what decide, with, with, a, with a career as diverse as yours, where you've talked, you've got your own specific research area, which has moved on from when you started from when you were a PhD student, plus all of the science communication and which involves the history of chemistry and the history of physics, the history of nuclear physics, um, the history of Arabic science. And, you know, it's incredibly diverse. The question was, well, how do you actually decide what you're going to do next? <laughs> why, why did you come up with quantum biology as a, as a topic? Okay, well, it actually did happen at a time when I was probably most active as a researcher in nuclear physics. Oh, I had just published a paper which is, you know, is now very highly cited in, 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 in nuclear physics, studying particular types of exotic nuclei with uh, um, very, very rich in neutrons. Uh, nucle an atomic nucleus has protons and neutrons, but if they're very rich in, in neutrons, certain nuclei have the outermost neutrons floating around the outside, what's called a neutron halo. It's a very exotic structure that, that requires sophisticated mathematical modeling. And I'd published a, a paper on that and I was giving lots of talks at conferences on it, um, followed up with several other papers. So things were going well on the research front. And then my colleague, who is the co-author of the book, Life of the Edge, John Joe McFadden, this was 90, 1997. So some, some while back, and this is how far back my interest goes, he came and gave a seminar to our physics department at Surrey. So, so he's, a, he's a, a, a molecular biologist in the next faculty with Surrey. He gave a talk on something called adaptive mutations. Um, you know, particular bacteria, they will mutate in one direction preferentially to another if there's something waiting that's, that, 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 that uh, gives them an advantage at that end, even before they know that it's there. So sort of teleological. So, so it was really weird. And he, he had this hand wavy quantum mechanical explanation that they, they're in a superposition of going this way and that way at the same time. It was weird. Most of my colleagues in the physics department basically laughed at him. I, I didn't feel sorry for him. I, I, I was sufficiently interested to want to talk to him afterwards. And that then kicked off um, over a decade of us basically getting together uh, over coffee or a beer and just talking about potentially quantum mechanics playing a role in certain biological, molecular biological processes. Nothing serious at all. But by the turn of the millennium, by, by, sorry, by about 2010, something like 2010, 2011, quantum biology was starting to be a thing. 
And we thought, well, okay, maybe we should stretch this beyond just a hobby. Maybe we should do something serious. Took on PhD students, started attending conferences uh, on the subject and gradually got into it. And I got to the point where I felt I'd done what I wanted to do in nuclear physics. Uh, and I've always just pursued what I, th I think is going to be interesting and exciting for me. That's the nice thing about academic freedom. You know, you can have those academics who will burrow down into a particular area and that's all they'll do for their career. They become the world experts in something very specific and you need those people. Then you have those who sort of flit around and just, you know, sort of having this sort of helicopter view of trying to make connections between different fields. I, I've sort of maybe moved from the, slightly from the former to the latter now in that I talk to chemists and biologists. Um, but I've just found quantum biology even if it was speculative, even if it's wrong and there's nothing in it, I, th I felt it was worthwhile looking into it because I just found it interesting. I think in some ways, you know, the reason we're having this conversation, the reason that you get rewarded with prizes like the Wilkins Bernal Medal are is because those three are good examples from history of people who did the same, who had magpie-like interests, but enough devotion to, to the question you know, Wilkins came from the Manhattan Project before he started working on, on DNA. Medawar did a whole range of things. Do you, do you think that is part of your personality to to be easily distracted? I suppose is the is the harsh way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, I, I I've always had an interest in sort of deep deeper questions than just the the pragmatic applied areas of physics. So you know, philosophy of quantum mechanics, for example. But it's always just been a, a hobby. And you know, you know, for, for for academics, when you want to get on in your career, you know, there's the publish or perish. You know, you just have to churn out the papers. You have to become an expert in an area sufficiently that you can produce results and and show your worth and tick boxes the way academics have to do. And I found that I, I got to the point of my career where I felt I didn't have to do that. I wouldn't say that I'm. You know, if working quantum biology, I don't tell a biologist how to think or explain stuff to them. I'm bringing my expertise as a quantum physicist to an area which also requires expertise from computational chemistry and from molecular biology and from mathematics and so on. So working in an in interdisciplinary area doesn't mean you have to be a jack of all trades, master of none. You're a master of one area that you bring and you, you learn to talk to and use sort of a common language with scientists from completely different fields. That's what I now find invigorating and exciting. Yes, and I think that the, you know, the, the way you started that answer was simply by saying, well, you had a coffee with John Joe yeah. uh, or a beer. And, and, and I think that's where always the most interesting conversations start. Absolutely, is absolutely. Talking to people well outside your field. Because I can't actually keep up with how many questions are coming in, I am gonna take you up on your offer and just do a couple of quick fire ones. Okay. See where they, uh, see where they go. Some of them I think will be easy to answer quickly. Some of them you're going to need to contextualise. <laughs> right. Here's an interesting one. Biology is said to be this is from David Lewis. Um, biology is said to be meaningless without the idea of evolution by natural selection. I concur. Um, might the same apply to quantum biology? Quantum meaning? Well, I mean. My, my answer here is that there's, there's nothing magical about quantum mechanics. The fact that you know, evolution is, is, is true is, is that life has had three and a half, four billion years to find all the tricks it can to enable evolution to take place. If there, some of those tricks involve reaching down to the quantum world, that's not surprising. You know, it's, it's not surprising that quantum mechanics might play a role in, in, in life because I come from a background of nuclear physics where inside the atomic nucleus, everything's quantum. It's surprising if you can get away with not using quantum mechanics. We just use a bit of what's called Newtonian classical mechanics. So for me, it's not something uh, controversial or unusual that uh, life may have evolved the ability to utilize the tricks of the quantum world to help it make its processes more efficient. Okay, cool. Um, just to answer very briefly, uh, Stuart Parker and Sue de Pomeroy, uh, de Pomeroy have asked, uh, is that Schrodinger's cat behind me? No, that's Lushkin. Uh, she's been asleep and I can't move her. She's sitting on my jumper. Um, okay, uh, so here's an interesting question because this is, this is from C. McConnell. 
this is a really important question, in fact, for how we do science, because science ultimately isn't just speculation. It's testable hypotheses and experiment. Mm -hmm. So um, C. McConnell uh, has asked, you mentioned that you test specific concepts with experiments. Can you give an example or just talk more generally about the types of experiment or test you would do in quantum biology theory? Yes, well, I, of course, something like, let's take the example of the, the magnetoreception in birds. It's, it's very difficult to, to, to test where that, uh, whether that compass inside the bird has a quantum origin while the bird is in flight. You know? So, so it, it, it's, it's much more difficult to do the experiments in quantum biology than to develop the theories. Um, what people have done in the past is, is look at individual biomolecules, uh, they excite them by pulsing sort of um, uh, them with laser light. So, so they, they, they become energetically, uh, energetically excited and see how then they give away that light. There are certain properties of these molecules that we can learn about by using techniques uh, in, in like spectroscopy, um, uh, um, what's it? Femtochemistry, so the ideas are very, very sort of short pulses of laser light that can excite these, these, these molecules is one way of probing them. But it's very difficult to be able to switch off all the other thousands of chemical reactions that go inside a living cell in order to focus in on that one mechanism that you want to be examining. You know, we're, in physics, we're used to be able to do that. You know, you, you conduct your experiments at near zero temperature inside a vacuum, shielded from outside interference, and you tweak dials and change things like temperature and the, the amplitude of your laser or whatever. You can't control all those variables inside living cells. And so it's very difficult to zoom in and, and, and look at some of these, uh, these experiments. But they, they still, you know, people are, people are getting very, rather sort of imaginative at the sort of experimental programs they're developing to study them. Yeah, I mean, I, as you were saying that, I was thinking about how from my own field, which is um, to do with vision, or at least it was 20 years ago, that those are experiments that we, we've been doing for many years, many decades, in fact, where you can take single um, photoreceptors and stimulate and excite them. Hmm. And to, to the extent that we know that photoreceptors are capable of detecting a single photon. But the question for the biologist then becomes that reductive, almost physics-like approach. Is that what is actually happening in the body? Right. And those are the answers that are really difficult to answer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just, just because you see a process happening once you've isolated that one molecule and you've zapped it with a, with a, a laser pulse. Oh yes, it's 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 showing me the the way it gives off its light, the way it de-excites it exactly as my theory predicts. That yeah, you're right. That's far removed from whether or not it, do, it behaves in exactly the same way when it's embedded inside a living uh, cell. Whether a photoreceptor inside a, a bird's uh, retina behaves exactly as it would when it's um, isolated inside a laboratory doing experiments on it individually. It's yeah, it's hard. We've, we've seen that quite recently in a, a sort of effect that gets reported on the press a lot and talked about, but often by people like us talking about science in, in the media. I don't know whether you came across this, but um, last year a paper was published that showed that duck-billed platypuses, you know, amongst the more weird animals that exist anyway, um, fluoresce in all sorts of colours in the infrared and ultraviolet spectrum that we can't see. So if you shine, no one had thought to shine a UV light at a a platypus until last year and, and it turns out that they they sort of day glow disco under that particular light <laughs> the question then becomes is that functional right is, is that just an artifact or is that something which has evolved for specific purpose and we don't know the answer to that yeah yeah and i think to some extent you know physicists and chemists uh, and, and biologists differ here because a, a biologist will often say if it's not functional, if it's only going along for the ride, then I don't find it that interesting. Whereas a physicist sees it as isolated as a, as a, as a mechanism that if it happens, it happens and that's interesting. I don't care if life needs it to function. <laughs> it, it's there, it happens. I, I found some quantum mechanics. So I think maybe it's a different philosophies as we approach these problems. 
absolutely and it's, it's like you said a minute ago that you know biology is too messy for physicists that's but, right <laughs> The old joke being that um, that you know f physicists always regard living things as single point spheres, don't they? In order yeah, for your exactly, your yeah. models to work. Yeah. Yes, let's take a spherical cow in the vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let's broaden the conversation out um, because, and, and it's still the same conversation, really. But Rebecca asked a question: How has the public understanding of science been shaped by the media? Um, in the last few years, and I'm just expanding on that, but also within the current social and political time uh, that, uh, that, that is, the, you know, the COVID pandemic. Well, certainly in the last year, uh, I, I've seen a huge change in how the media and how politicians and policymakers view science. It used to be that science would offer their advice they would, uh, um, which, you know, which feed into sort of policy decisions, but politicians know that, well, yes, but you give me, just because you've given me data and evidence, there's plenty of other things I need to worry about, you know, like economics and public acceptability and, and the, whether or not I'll get elected in the next round or whatever. Um, but I think we found in the pandemic that we're learning that not only can we not do without science, you know, following the science, following the data, following the evidence has become a mantra now that I, I think is, is, is a good thing uh, for science. But also people are starting to learn a little bit about how science is done, the scientific method, you know, the, the, the uncertainty, the, the, uh, the clinical trials, the, uh, uh, the idea that we don't have enough data yet to, to, to have a firm answer on this. Um, so the way we do science and, and, the, and changing our minds in the light of new, new evidence and new data coming in that, well, we thought that because we didn't have enough evidence. Now we have this new evidence. We've changed our minds and that's fine. That doesn't mean we don't know what we're doing. That's the way science works. So I think that society is learning more about the scientific method now through, you know, unfortunately through a global pandemic. But nevertheless, I think it's, it's helped. I think probably for the future, th th you know, science will be taken more seriously when we have to tackle other challenges, like, of course, like climate change. In, in terms of the earlier part, we said how, how it's shaped by the media. One good thing that has happened, not just in the last year, but certainly over the last decade or two, that science journalists are so much better these days than they used to be. They are, they, they are better trained. They, even those who are not trained as scientists actually understand how science works and, and, um, and talk to scientists and, and, and listen to them. Uh, and scientists have learned to trust journalists and the media a lot more than they used to in the past. When I first started as a science communicator, wow, none of my colleagues would even dream of talking to, a, you know, some journalist from a newspaper rang up and wants to find out some research. Oh, Jim will talk to him because Jim doesn't mind talking to journalists. I'm not, I'm, you know, they'll probably, twist my story and report something wrong. But yes, you know, stories get reported wrong all the time, but part of, a big part of the responsibility is, is with the scientists, of course, to give the journalists the right story. But that has improved dramatically in the last 10 or 20 years. And I think particularly in the UK, more so than in most other countries, that has helped push science communication, public engagement in science forward in this country dramatically. What do you think has changed in that landscape in the last 20 years or so? I mean, apart from Radio 4, uh, of which we both present regular programmes. You know. Yeah, well, I think actually that, that, that's a good, certainly the BBC have, have, you know, public broadcasting has played a role there, that uh, they, they have allowed us to make science documentaries. I mean, part of it is... Uh, you know, what's in vogue, you know, 20 years ago, history documentaries were very popular in the BBC, we're making lots of history documentaries. Um, you and I have both been involved in sort of TV documentaries, you know, 10, 15 years ago when it started, they started making more science documentaries and science became the darling of, of, of the BBC, you know, and the birth of, you know, such monsters as Brian Cox, for it's example. Terrible, isn't he? I mean, he's yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> what have we created? Oh. Um, so the BBC certainly have, have helped there, but I think just the whole um, process of science communication has, has dramatically changed. It was the public understanding of science. Science communication was, we are the experts, you sit down and listen 
and we'll, you know, you're the empty vessels, we'll fill you with our wisdom. And it's become much more a collaborative public engagement with science. Um, we've seen the rise of science festivals, uh, we've seen organizations that promote connections between scientists and the media, scientists and politicians, scientists and the public. So there's lots of different things that have all helped transform science communication and made it respectable. You know, it wasn't 25, 30 years ago, it wasn't a respectable thing to do. It was a thing you did if you'd finished doing your research, if you just wanted to, you know, go off and write popular science books, fine, but don't call yourself a serious scientist anymore. That has now changed. It's become integral to how we do science. Part of how we do science is also the fact that we feel we have to communicate it. Do you think there is an obligation for scientists or publicly funded scientists to make it easier to answer, to communicate their work, not just to their colleagues, but to, to the general public? Absolutely. I, I don't think it's for everyone. You know, not, not everyone is comfortable. It depends on your, your personality. You know, those of us who at the forefront of science communication, we're the show offs, right? You know, we're here, you know, listen to me, look at me. I've got something very exciting to say and I'm very enthusiastic about it and I wave my hands around. Um, certainly many more practicing scientists and engineers and technologists should be allowed to explain what they do. Very often it, there's, there are still the dinosaurs who, who say, no, you get your head down, write that report, write that paper, um, do your work, don't, go and give a talk to school kids, leave that for someone else. So it's, it was seen as less of a priority. But the, the, the young generation of, of scientists certainly are, are much more willing and, and eager to, to engage. And that's a good thing. So as, as many as possible should be allowed to devote some fraction of their time explaining what they do for all sorts of reasons. You know, whether it's because just to fascinate, to infuse the next generation, whether it's to justify the fact that we are publicly funded, whether it's to make sure we have a more scientifically literate society so that people know that they have to go and get vaccinated or they know why they should be wearing face masks or whatever. And there are lots of reasons why we should be communicating science. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Lillian Nandy asked a question, um, which I'm gonna slightly, slightly evolve but it bounces off what you've just been saying. Do you imagine you've only got one area of science that you can modify, but what, what area is it that you think that the public needs to know more about? Oh, um, you can't say quantum biology. Well, you know, I mean, th there's a lot of blue sky. Uh, my, my research interest is much more so is blue sky science. So it's not applied. It's the, the stuff that I do in quantum biology or nuclear physics or the, or the, the interpretation of quantum mechanics is not going to lead to a, a new nonstick frying pan next week or indeed to a, a new vaccine against the pandemic. It doesn't have uses. It's just, it's, I want, I'm asking questions about the world around me, about how the universe works. And I find that fascinating. And I'm very grateful that I'm paid to do that. Um, no, I think for me, what is most important, and as it ties back to what I said a, li a little earlier, what's most important is, is to get across how science works, you know, and, and, and maybe applying some of the techniques and tricks of the scientific method in everyday life. You know, we are now in a world where we are bombarded with information on a daily basis from all directions. A lot of it is misinformation. Some of it is disinformation, deliberately there to sort of throw us in the wrong direction. And how does the average person know what to believe, who to trust? You know, what website is, is, is telling you the truth and what is just fake news? Um, then you see the polarization on social media, you know, where everything's black or white. You cannot have a middle ground. In that, that's anathema to science. In science, we say, well, you've got a point, but you've also got a point because you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And, and I'm not certain about my opinions. I'm prepared to change my mind. You know, I'm prepared in the light of it. All of those ideas that we use in science, that we're trained to do as scientists, I think could be propagated out into wider society. I don't mean that in an arrogant, preachy sort of way. We scientists know how to think, and you should all think the way we think. But, but there, are, there are tried and tested approaches the way we do science that allow us to reach the truth of a matter or to, to, to find out what we can trust and how we should behave in our daily lives that I think would be useful to, to explain more clearly. Yes, 
yes, I think that's true. And I think it's important. I think that the way that we frame science, uh, and I think the way that we teach it at schools as well is not necessarily a re reflection of no. how science actually works. As no. a, a phrase that we use in science communication or in public engagement studies is that science is a way of knowing. And there yeah. are multiple ways of knowing. It's just that we happen to think that our one, the scientific methods, plural, is yeah. most in tune with the notion of an objective reality. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, the, I think people confuse science with knowledge or facts. Um, um, facts and knowledge, that is something that science allows us to try and find, try and gain. But science is a process. Science is, is, a, is a method for learning about the world. The facts that we learn about the world, that's not science, right? That's, that's you know, the, the Mars and Jupiter or whether it's, you know, um, bacteria or cells or plate tectonics, or whatever. those are facts about the world around us. That's not science. It's just that these are facts that science has allowed us to learn about. Um, yeah, quick question from James B. How many of the books behind you have you actually read? Yeah, <laughs> I just, I, I showed you this before we started. So see, see look, look, it zooms up. Look at that. Look how many books I've got. I must be so clever. I must, um, how many books? I, a quarter. How many have you written? <laughs> ah, you see, this is where my, my, my modesty shines through because all, all my books, you know, particularly the, the multiple copies that I haven't shifted because the publishers send you a box full and and not enough you don't have enough friends who want them plus all the the translations they're all upstairs in my study so they're all out of the way so i don't have any of my books here yeah yeah sure we all, we all <laughs> but i have but i have done zoom sessions and events <laughs> from my study which is very embarrassing because all the books behind me have jim out clearly on them <laughs> terribly embarrassing um th this, this is another question from david lewis actually but i think it follows on from what we were just talking about before i asked the really question which was um do you think that there is a duty for scientists to enter political debates? We've seen, obviously, because of the pandemic, we've seen this more in the last 18 months or so than possibly at any time in living memory. But what do you think about the nature of science as the, the sort of noble aim that science is above grubby politics and is potentially apolitical and maybe amoral? The two things which I don't think are true, but what, what, what do you think on that? Yeah. Scientists are people, right? And scientists have their own biases and, and motives and, all, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, they want to, to, to promote their ideas, their theories, their results, because they want to get promotion or because they want to make a name for themselves. And like any, all walks of life, scientists are fallible. Uh, but science itself as a process, as a method, I think is, is important and I think it's very useful. I don't think scientists have a duty to be involved in public life. Uh, no more than you know, any other profession has a duty to be involved in public life. I think that, that would be an arrogant assumption that somehow scientists are, are better at solving the world's problems than, than anyone else. No, scientists, we we bring our expertise our way as you say there are different ways of gaining knowledge we bring our way of learning about the world uh, and and providing humankind new ways of dealing with how, how you know how we live our lives those of those of the scientists who, who who want to enter public life or who want to sort of be involved in politics absolutely should and there should be more i mean i'd love for there to be more scientifically trained members of parliament for example you know, scientifically literate, by which I mean understanding the nature of uncertainty and reproducibility and the reliability of data. And, you know, wouldn't it be great if politicians could be more like scientists and admit when they're wrong? <laughs> you know, it's a virtue it, for scientists, isn't it? And it's a, and, and it's a curse yeah. for politicians. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? You know, for scientists to say I was wrong means I now know something better. I now, I, I now know you know, I'm closer to the truth if there is such a thing out, out there. For politicians to say they're wrong is somehow a sign of weakness. Uh, and wouldn't it be refreshing if they said, no, I, I thought that, but I've changed my mind because I've, in the light of new evidence, I now have a different view. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Here's a, this, this question I think is interesting. This is from um, Justine Manino. Um, she says, I feel that STEM careers, that's science, technology, engineering, and, and maths, and accessibility to science disciplines is better than ever, agreed. But quantum science still seems like a more adult topic. Um, how do we engage our youngsters in, in quantum physics so that we can see you know, the, the, the work that you've been involved with for the last however many years you know, continue yeah. and flourish? It, it, it's, it is a, a delicate balance what we teach school children in terms of science. You know, apart from the fact that teachers are overworked and having to sort of uh, fight fires and, uh, you know, they're, 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 they don't have the, you know, the, the luxury of being say, well, you know, I'll teach this or teach. They don't have the luxury that university academics like me have. Um, but, you know, you have to teach the nuts and bolts of science, you know, the, the basics. You, the, there's no getting around springs and 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 uh, uh, and batteries and and uh, test tubes, you know, the, the, the stuff that you have to learn. All, teaching the way science works is important, but also I think you have to keep kids infused and excited and teaching them about whether it's quantum mechanics or genetics or astronomy, you know, the, the, the more exciting areas of science, we need to include that because, I mean, you, you must get this as well, Adam, that, you know, you, you meet people, we talk about something exciting in the science and wow, if only I'd been taught that at school. If only my teacher at school had told me about, you know, whether it's Schrodinger's cat or whether it's, you know, uh, uh, um, space expanding or whatever, um, because that's, that hasn't been part of the curriculum. You can't devote that entire curriculum to the exotic stuff, you know, what happens if you fall inside a black hole. But you, you need to sprinkle some of that into the curriculum just so that, I mean, kids are naturally curious. They want to know. Uh, and so many get turned off science, not through, I mean, sometimes through the fault of, of a teacher, but very often it's not through the fault of a teacher, through the fault of a teacher having to teach them something that they just simply don't find interesting. So, so right. we've got to find ways of keeping it interesting, keeping it up to date, smattering of the latest discoveries in science. You know, yeah. I, 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 think... I had an A-level physics teacher who I remember just telling, he'll tell us stuff like, um, you know, who, who just won the Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, because they they discovered the you know, the electro weak unification for oh what's that so he so he'll he'll do, and and obviously being teenagers we were quite keen to keep him talking about that rather than teaching us about kinetic theory or whatever it was his teacher um, but uh, you know teachers who 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 are confident enough to be able just to say a few things about what's more exciting in science that keeps the children engaged for longer well yes I mean I, I wonder whether we are due. A, a sort of a sort of conservative revolution in the curriculum because I think a lot of teachers are also frustrated by having to teach things that I, I don't know maybe running trolleys down slopes isn't as important as be, as being as it's been taught for the last century and knowing those fundamentals or those basics of mechanics maybe that isn't necessarily as important as as firing a classroom up by talking about what happens if you fall inside a black hole. I know there are teachers listening to this and and I may, maybe some of them are whooping right now, maybe some of them are booing. Um, but I think it's important to ask that question. When I look at the biology curriculum, you know, my area, evolution and genetics, comes in relatively late, a long time after learning quite a lot of stuff about things that I don't think are that interesting. But that may be because I'm biased. To, I'm always going to be interested in the the glossy or the, the you know the like, like we were talking about at the beginning because I'm a magpie too. Mm. I think what what of course has changed from you know our generation to, to you know children now is that they have access to all the facts and knowledge at their fingertips. So it's not necessary to teach them things that they have to remember. They can look it up. I mean, partly that was why I preferred physics to chemistry and biology because I didn't have to remember stuff. I enjoyed physics because it, it meant it was, a, it was puzzles, it was working things out. And I think teaching school children how to think scientifically is, is becoming more important than just teaching them the basics, the facts, that stuff they can look up. They still need to, I think they still need to understand, you know, rolling balls down slopes and, and, and uh, you know, stuff that goes all the way back to Galileo because they need to be able to work out, you know, acceleration and distance and speed that is something that then leads on to 
more advanced areas of physics if they carry on with that. You can't jump into the advanced areas of physics. You need to teach them the basics that they need for, I mean, most people aren't gonna become practicing scientists. Let's, let's admit that, you know. Uh, so they need to have the skills, the scientific skills to be able to navigate through daily life. And there, I think what's more important is to teach them how to think scientifically rather than bombard them with facts. Yes, I agree. And, you know, risk and probability are, are two things that come late in, in my experience in a scientific career, understanding statistics, mm. which is mm. so fundamental to understanding all aspects of, of, of science are things that I think are daunting and don't appear early enough. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the next talk after this on the YouTube channel is David Spiegelhalter, who is, I don't think there's anyone on earth who's better at explaining, um, making stats ex exciting. So, so if you're listening, if you're watching now, I think it's June 13th, but I can check that well, whilst we're talking. Um, if you could do it all over again, would we still be having this conversation in the alternative Everettian world where you didn't uh -huh. do this? Ah, you're, you're touching on my one of my le less favourite interpretations of quantum mechanics. But <laughs> um, you, you can never retrace the same path. Um, if, if, if I had my time again, there are a, a, a trillion different routes I would have taken. I would never have arrived at this point now. But, you know, I may not have done a PhD in nuclear physics, I may have done a PhD in cosmology or, or, or uh, some other area of physics. Physics is clearly what I, I enjoyed most. Would I have ended up spending a lot of my time communicating science, explaining, delving into the history, the philosophy? Yeah, probably because that's my, that's part of my personality. I couldn't see myself working on one problem in, in physics for the whole of my career. You know, for me, you know, life, life is short. Life goes by very quickly and you get one shot at it. Uh, and I like to seize my opportunities, but it was never a, a, a big plan. I just let things happen, making decisions, hopefully the right decisions, because I really have very few regrets in life, you know, along the way. But I'd have ended up in a very different place probably if I had my time again. Uh, but hopefully still the same, doing the same sorts of, of, of balance of different things. Now, listen, we're, we're, we've got a few more minutes left. Um, okay. so I'm going to fire some, some through. Um, I, I quickly want to ask you about the history of science, because this is, a, this is an area of knowledge and expertise and academia that both of us have ended up being part of mm. because of our interest in our, in our subjects and communicating to a wider, wider public. And, and I think you're, you've done a lot of history of science and history of physics and chemistry over, over the years. But I think the thing, the one that is most interesting to most people, certainly to me, is uh, what well, you wrote about it in Pathfinders. Um, yeah. I can't remember what the documentary was called, but it was about Arabic science. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The House of Wisdom. Yeah, give give us a give us a sort of what uh, just an overview. Your your stimulation, your interest in this is okay. From yeah, well, um, you know, my father's from Iraq, so I was born in Baghdad. And although my mum's English and English is my first language, I was brought up very sort of very sort of Western household. When we settled in the UK, as it, when I was a teenager, I was I could remember going to school in Iraq and learning about some of these famous scholars that I felt should be as well known as Newton and Galileo and, and some, some of the ancient Greeks, you know, Avicenna and, and uh, uh, Alhazen and, and people like that, that I thought, well, th th these are famous scientists. How come we don't know their story? And, and so I got involved and in, got interested in it about 15 years ago, just researching their contributions. So these are scientists who lived in the medieval Islamic world. So between the eighth and 13th centuries, and they, progress science incredibly, you know, astronomy and medicine and chemistry and mathematics, algebra and so on. Uh, and I felt their story should be told, partly because it's fascinating, people don't know about it, and partly because it shows how science and progress is a continuum. You know, just when Europe went into the Dark Ages, science didn't switch off, it switched off in Europe. It didn't switch off in China and India and the Islamic world. And so it, it, it shows how science develops from one civilization to the next, but also an opportunity to talk about some of these fascinating figures. And I still find it exciting to think that these are people over a thousand years ago and, you know, and they were carrying out experiments and they were d developing ideas in astronomy. 
I mean, in of its time, you know, it might be a bit silly now we look back at it, but of its time, this was incredible at a time when Europe, Europeans were pretty much scrambling around in the mud. Yeah, <laughs> I can hear. I don't know whether there's any historians of science watching this, but I, I think I heard them screaming at that point. Yeah, OK, there were there were a few. Yes, there, there were a few that, that, who were who were held up, you know, the, the, the light, you know, the Williams of Ockham's, the Gerard of Cremona. There were there were there were great Europeans pre the Renaissance in science. Were, yes. <laughs> um, I, I think that I think my attraction to it comes from recognising that the complexities of science are reflected in the complexities of history as, as well. And that and it's, it sort of talks to the, the, the question we were talking about a minute ago, which is how we teach science, that actually reveling in the complexities of history and how we got from there to here, I find much more stimulating than the way that history has been taught traditionally, which is that, you know, a line of most almost exclusively men discovering things and passing that at the bottom onto the next one. And it just turns out that that isn't what happened at all, apart from Darwin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, I don't like the idea of science being neatly packaged and, and uh, delivered as though it's all done and dusted. I like to, 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 to revel in its messiness and all the blind alleys and wrong directions that we went in before we figured out how things are. So you know, for me, history and telling the story of how science developed brings the subject to life. Uh, not everyone feels that way, but uh, that's what stimulates me. Absolutely. All right. So listen, well, I think we're down to our last couple. Um, what, what, are you, what are you doing at the moment? Um, well, I've just submitted a manuscript of a book, so that's out of the way. I'm waiting for a research grant to, uh, to get the green light, so I'm sort of waiting for that to happen. I've got a whole load of final year projects to mark um, tomorrow. Um, what's the, the book? Usual, you know, the usual stuff. What's, what's the new book? Um, well, actually, it's very much along the lines, of this, which is why I'm just spouting this so, so eloquently. It's about how we might apply the uh, scientific method more uh, widely in everyday life. The book, controversial, I should say, the book's title is, and don't snigger, the joy of science, <laughs> because there's because that's that famous book, the joy of cooking. Yes, yes, that's I'm why aware of it. it's called the joy. Well, I think David Spiegelhalter wrote the joy of stats as well. That is true. Yeah, we have that. That's true. Well, there were the joy of there was the whole series. Um, you know, our our good friend Hannah Fry uh, um, presented yes. a TV documentary on the joy of data. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. As you want one question, I'm going to sneak in quickly, which someone someone's just asked. Um, sorry, but I've lost it. I've lost the name. But it was it was about it was the question was. Um, well, I I'm I'm a, I am part of a partnership with Hannah. So, you know, we're a double act. If you could have any per person living or dead to be your co-host for the Life Scientific or just a, 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 a someone to share the limelight with, who would it be? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's a tough one. Um, um, uh, I don't know, I don't know. How about what? I'm, see, I'm, I'm trying to think of all these great scientists, great names. I think, well, no, but he was dodgy. But he was yeah. dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a young, a young Niels Bohr. There's that's the most boring name I can think of that hopefully isn't controversial. <laughs> I was thinking maybe um, what's his name's Vicky? Was it Franz Vicky? Hans Vicky? Oh yes, Vicky. Yes, yes. The the, the 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 guy who referred to people as spherical bastards. Spherical bastards because they were the bastards, bastards from every direction. You, you, you looked at them. He sounds like he could have been a lar. That's true. That's true. Um, no, not really. Listen, that's all I'm afraid we've got time for. I, you know, as ever, thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm sorry that the last two times we've done this, it's been down, um, down, down, down the computer, down the screen, and soon we will do this on stage. Soon. Well, hopefully many more people have been able to watch this. That is true. That is very Thank true. You. There'll be loads more events at the Royal Society um, coming up, and I'm sure you will be present at, at many of them. So thank you, Jim. Congratulations again for being awarded the 2020 Wilkins Bernal Medal Art Prize Medal from the Royal Society. Thank you all for watching this evening and of course for getting involved <laughs> with your millions of questions, which I hope I got through many of them. So there's loads more information about up and coming Royal Society events on the website. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, it helps spread the message wide. So it's really useful if you do that. 
Um, but also you can find more, more information about events by signing up to their newsletter. The link is found uh, below the YouTube screen as we're speaking now. And that, I'm afraid, is it. Thank you so much to the Royal Society and congratulations, Jim Alpilly. Thank you very much.